watching the Creation Liberty Hour. This is show number six for September 12th, 2011. Well, thanks for joining us, everybody. My name is Chris Johnson. I'm the founder of Creation Liberty Evangelism, and our ministry's purpose is to win the lost to Christ and to present the truth of science and God's Word. And we hold to the position without apology that God's Word is literally true and scientifically accurate, and that evolution is not just a dumb theory. It's one of the most dangerous and destructive religions in the history of mankind. Uh, Lorraine will not be joining me today. Uh, she had to go see a client. Uh, she helps uh, a lot of... Uh, elderly or, or paraplegic type people. Uh, she helps handicapped and all that, uh, and so she had to go see a new client today. And Tanya was also busy with, with uh, her sons. Uh, so Andy is helping us out in the, back, in the background. He's running admin for our chat room, and he'll be helping me out today, so I appreciate him volunteering for us. And we're going to go over some topics that we covered uh, last week and some questions we had last week from some of the uh, evolutionists. So we'll go ahead and get started, and if you want to go ahead and post your questions, uh, simply type something into the chat uh, room. Uh, if you're watching us from the uh, website, the website creationliberty.com, you click on podcast. And if you're watching us from that chat room, just type something into the chat box and hit enter. And a little window will, uh, will pop up and you can sign in or register uh, your username and you can join us in chat. And as always, if you want to get your question posted and you want to try to get yourself put first in line to get your question or comment posted, the best way to do it is to put your name and location where you're from. So for example, if I was going to ask a question, I would say my name's Chris and I'm from Indiana. And that'll help you get you into the first place position to get your question uh, talked about on the podcast. So we're going to start with uh, last week. Uh, we had a lady, I believe her name was Laura or Lauren, uh, something like that. I don't remember exactly what her name was, but she was asking about the definition of beneficial. We were discussing, you know, because one of the, you know, I have seen evolutionists try to use the Chihuahua as evidence for evolution. Um, I know that it even sounds funny just saying it. It's not, it doesn't just sound funny. The logic behind it's actually pretty funny too. Uh, but the thing is, the Chihuahua is not evidence for evolution. And what I told her, I said, if you took all the Chihuahuas that we have in the world today and released them back into the wild, they're not going to last very long, okay? The Chihuahua gene pool will end, I promise. And so, you know, she got into, uh, you know, discussions with me about that. And then she did pose a question. I do have to give her credit because what a lot of evolutionists don't do, they don't uh, define their terms when they come into debate. Because the reason a debate becomes endless is because you don't define your terms when you come into debate. Usually if you define your terms, the debate is over, okay? Uh, you either choose the side of logic or you don't at that point. So basically, uh, sorry, just double checking my screen here. I'm having, to, I'm having to run multiple things and multitask today. So if I'm a little behind on my speech, you'll have to be patient with me. The thing is, when defining beneficial, she says, could you define that for me? And I stopped to think about it, and I said, you know what? I'm going to have to consider that and get back with you because nobody's really asked me for my d definition of beneficial. Be and, and the reason I was, I was kind of careful about answering it, and the reason for that, Laura, or Lauren, I can't remember which one, which one your name is. I don't want to offend you on that. Um, I just you know, have a bad memory when it comes to some of those things. But if I was going to say it depends, beneficial depends on your goal. For example, if I was, if my goal was to destroy my refrigerator in the kitchen, let's take that for example, a roll of duct tape would not be beneficial to me. So do you see how it's goal orientated? Now, if we're talking about things being able to reproduce and survive, and we're talking about beneficial for that, survivability would be a beneficial, muta uh, or not beneficial mutation, I'm getting into phrasing now. It, survivability would be beneficial. At that point, what the evolutionists are going to do is say, well, you know, just like the argument I hear all the time about how if someone in, uh, you know, in Africa gets sickle cell anemia, they are less likely to get malaria. I've heard that argument many times. This is something that, you know, they say, well, you know, it's, a, it's beneficial. And I, I would tell them, you know, it might be beneficial for a very short amount of time. You, it's possible that you could define it that way if you wanted to. But if you look at overall, it is not beneficial. It can't be defined that way. Because if you took a, if you took a person with um, sickle cell anemia 
and you put them into a population of normal people who do not have sickle cell anemia, that person's going to be at a disadvantage. Getting sickle cell anemia is not an advantage. And though it may, it may prevent you from getting malaria because you're, you know, whatever uh, causes the malaria to affect your body can't connect with the misshapen uh, red blood cells in your, in your system, uh, even though that occurs, there's all sorts of other problems it causes. And the, uh, look, the disadvantages far outweigh the benefits. And so there's lots of problems that are caused. I mean, we could talk about that for a long time, but she wanted my definition of beneficial. Well, it depends on what you're talking about. And if you're talking about, you know, populations of certain variations of animals, like the chihuahua, I would say survivability would be a beneficial trait. Now, what traits are those? Well, for example, you know, if somebody wants to argue, well, the chihuahua is smaller, so therefore it can hide, it's easier for it to hide. That's true, but dogs have to do certain things, you know, like hunt, and that, those kind of things in order to survive out in the wild. That's what we see from do you know, wild dogs and wolves and coyotes and things like that. They have to hunt in the wild to survive. The chihuahua is not going to be able to do this. It might be able to hide, but that's about it. And you know, it's going to come up to something and yelp at it, and that's about all it can do, and it's going to get eaten. The chihuahuas would not survive under normal conditions in the world. And the thing we have to consider is that the chihuahua only survives because of unnatural selection. See, the evolutionists claim that natural selection is, you know, you know, benefits their theory that the natural selection process, but it doesn't at all. Natural selection is actually against evolution for all sorts of reasons, okay? Natural selection is going to select against mutations like a chihuahua because they're not beneficial in nature. Nature has a certain level of survivability that is required in order to live, in order for that population to survive. So nature is going to select against it. The only reason we have chihuahuas is because of unnatural breeding, unnatural selection that's been caused by humans, not by nature. So basically to argue that the chihuahua is somehow evidence for evolution is the same mistake that Darwin made. Because if you read his book carefully, he gives you tons of examples of unnatural selection, like he uses horse breeding and then tries to you know, extrapolate that to say, wow, this, you know, this is going to happen in nature, and we don't see that at all. There has been no experiments ever done that has ever showed that something like a chihuahua is going to come out of nature, okay? Even things like you know, the cheetah is moving to the genetic fringe. Not, they're not many of them are gonna keep surviving because it can't go past. You see, what's happening is that the evolutionist and the chihuahua and the cheetah are staring right at the border of the kinds, the biblical kinds but they can't see it because they don't want the Bible to be true. They want to start with the preconceived idea that there's millions of years of evolution, which has never been proven right in any kind of scientific means, but they're staring at it right in the face and they can't see it. And that's why we have to be careful of our presuppositions. And I do, I claim fully that I come from the presupposition of the Bible. I don't come from a presupposition of millions of years. I start with the Bible, which says they're going to bring forth after their kind. And I argue that there are genetic limits to the, to the variations you can get in kinds. Whereas the evolutionists will say there are no limits, okay? Just like you might be able to get, you know, bigger pigs, but you won't get a pig as big as Texas, okay? You might, and you'll have, you know, different variations. Some things will, you know, select for variations that will be beneficial in some areas and some for not. But all of these things were in the gene code originally, and they have slowly deteriorated to the points that they're at now where they might, you know, like, for example, Florida rabbits can't interbreed with Alaska rabbits, but, the, but both Alaska and Florida rabbits can interbreed with rabbits from Minnesota. But, you know, if you get too far apart down the genetic code, down the genetic line, it stops at a certain point. And once you get to the fringe, certain animals, certain of the same kind, may not be able to interbreed with each other at that point. But if you bring them back into the regular population from the central area, central location, they can breed with each other. They've just gone to a genetic fringe and they can't go past that. And so, the, again, the creationist argues there's a genetic limit to these changes. And that's exactly what we've seen in observable science, okay? You can't braid wings onto a, onto a horse and make him, you know, go faster, all right? It's just not going to happen. And, but the evolutionist has to believe that all these things are limitless, and that's just not part of science. So I just wanted to uh, make sure we came to that. Let's see here. I'm going to check the uh, chat here. Andy's helping me out with this. Uh, let's see here. Caleb asks, uh, why don't bugs slowly get bigger in order to take over the world? We know that bugs have the ability to be extremely powerful 
except they're too small, how would an evolutionist explain this? Well, I don't know how an evolutionist would explain it because I'm not an evolutionist. But if you're asking why bugs don't get incredibly huge, uh, if you watch our seminar number two, in fact, I just gave that seminar on Saturday. Uh, a lot of people really enjoyed that. You can watch an older version of that seminar for free on our website. If you want to see the new updated version with all the new information, uh, you can order that from us on our on online store, uh, the Creation Liberty Store, which is on, if you're watching us on the, uh, the podcast uh, website, uh, creationliberty.com, you click on podcast, uh, that kind of thing, you can see on the left-hand side there's the online store. You can get that there. But the, uh, we explain more about that. What happens with insects is that there's a what you call a surface area to volume ratio problem. Insects breathe through their skin through little things called spiracles. They're tiny little holes in the insect skin they breathe through. Now insects, because they breathe through their skin and because they're, you know, of their exoskeletons and because you know, they weigh so little, like for example an ant can fall out of an airplane, hit the ground, excuse me, it can hit the ground, and then get up and start walking again. And him falling through air is almost like us falling through water. It's basically not going to hurt him because he is not as dense as the air around him is. Um, so, but anyway, insects, that's a whole other thing. The point is that insects breathe through their skin. So how much an insect can breathe uh, also depends on how much surface area it has. And if you, you know, if you're learning science in high school, uh, I'm not sure, Caleb, because I can't remember how old you are. I remember discussing that. I think, I don't know if you're still in high school or not. If you're learning in some of your science classes, you have something uh, called a surface area to volume ratio problem with, and, and I don't know whether they'll teach this on insects or not. But if you had, let's say you had two ice cubes sitting out on the table, and I had cut one of them in half, which ice cube will melt faster? The one that was cut in half. Well, the question is why? Well, you've increased the surface area. As you cut it in half, now you have more surface area to the volume. So as an insect gets bigger, if you can imagine a ball, as it gets bigger and bigger and bigger, eventually there's going to be, I mean, it's both the surface area, just like if you blow up a balloon, both the surface area and the volume increase. But as it gets bigger, the volume is increasing faster than the surface area. So your surface area to volume ratio, pro there's, a, there's a ratio problem here. As an insect gets bigger, it eventually has more volume in ratio to the to the um, surface area than it does when it's smaller. So when it's smaller, it's it's more efficient. And as it gets bigger, it would have to have certain conditions on this planet to allow it to grow to great size. And if you watch our seminar number two, we do cover how they found you know fossilized centipedes eight feet long have been found, uh, fossilized cockroaches eighteen inches long. Uh, fossilized spider legs found three feet long. I mean, there were giant insects on this earth at one time, but they cannot get that big today. Like, for example, there's um, a, I have a, photographs of a replica that was made of a, they found a fossilized dragonfly with a 28-inch wingspan. The, the largest wingspan I have ever heard of is like a 50-inch wingspan dragonfly. I mean, you hit this thing going 60 miles an hour down the highway, he's not just going to squish on the windshield. He's going to join you in the front seat. I mean, these things were enormous, but they cannot, a, 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 fl a dragonfly of that dimension could not fly in today's atmosphere. As well as, you know, they find like a f 40 to 60 foot wingspan pterodactyls that could not possibly fly in today's atmosphere. They're just, there, there wasn't enough um, pressurized oxygen, uh, or excuse me, a pressurized atmosphere for them to fly. If you had oxygen under pressure in what you call hyperbaric oxygen conditions, and we, we cover reasons why the pre-flood atmosphere, I'm not going to go into details on it right now, but we cover that on seminar two, why the atmosphere had a, a, uh, a hyperbaric oxygen to it according to the biblical model, uh, then it would have allowed for larger insects. They could breathe under those conditions because as it gets bigger in, in today's atmosphere, it won't get enough oxygen to breathe because, you know, there's not enough surface area to how much volume is in there. But if you have pressurized oxygen, now they can grow bigger because they have more oxygen to breathe. So I hope that that makes sense to you on why bugs cannot get, you know, slowly bigger and become huge. I think the largest, like, for example, the probably one of the largest insects, um, and I would say, I don't know if it's the largest insect or not, but the largest spiders are the, uh, I think they call them the Goliath tarantulas, which surprisingly, I mean, they get a foot long. I mean, big tarantulas. And surprisingly, 
uh, they say they're friendly to humans. I find that really interesting. So uh, if you want to look up, uh, go onto YouTube sometime, look up Goliath Tarantula. You could probably go on there right now and find videos on these things. They're enormous, and they're fairly friendly towards humans. It's kind of interesting. But they're furry, and they're creepy, and girls are scared to death of them. So uh, I, I don't think you could have one as a pet if you're married. But anyhow, uh, let's see. I'm checking out uh, more of the chat here. Uh, I'm looking at, oh, yeah, we already skipped on that. Well, what does it say? Why stay small if you already evolved these powerful traits that help keep you, your kind, alive? Why did they stay small? Okay, I think we, we went into that question because that's not really, that's kind of um, contrary to the point. Because um, it comes with the, the wrong presupposition. It comes from an evolutionary supposition instead of the, the biblical supposition. Um, oh, so Caleb continued, he asked again here based on what I just said. He said, so they couldn't breathe enough to sustain themselves. That is correct. Basically, there's not enough oxygen in the atmosphere today for them to get that large. But in a pre-flood uh, hyperbaric oxygen atmosphere conditions, yes, they could. And that would make sense. Um, as to why there, uh, how there was more oxygen in the past than there is today, the evolutionists do not have an answer to this one. I've never even read a good theory on the subject. However, I do reference, if you watch uh, my seminar number two, I do reference to where uh, there are some scientists. I mean, one of the articles I referenced to, you know, they claim that lack of oxygen, not asteroids, killed the dinosaurs. As I, I referenced to an article where they talked about that because one uh, evolutionist was analyzing a pat an 80-foot tall apatosaurus and said, wait, this thing has nostrils the same size as a horse. So how could it get enough oxygen to survive? So he said there had to have been a higher level of oxygen in the atmosphere in the past for a creature to get that big. And I agree with them. I just think that the, evo the creationists have an answer to this. The evolutionists have no idea how to handle this one. Uh, and there again, um, what well, there's another one I was just thinking of. Oh, yeah, there's a, they found a gigantic water scorpion uh, fossilized, eight feet, eight feet long. See, I'm, I'm six feet tall. This thing was eight feet long. A uh, huge water scorpion, and the geologist that was analyzing this thing said there had to have been an enormous amount of oxygen in Earth's history in the past for something like this to get this big. You see, the evolutionists will just keep studying their science. Eventually, they're going to say, wow, the Bible's true. They're getting there. They're getting closer with every step, and if they'll just keep doing that, just keep climbing the mountain of truth, they'll find out that the Baptists were sitting at the top all along, right? So, <laughs> anyhow... Uh, let's see here. We're going to go on to uh, the next point because I don't have any more questions right now. So we're going to go on to the next point. I'm relying on Andy to keep a uh, keep an eye on the chat room because I, I can't even see it right now. I'm, I've got too many things up on my screen. Uh, I put out a new article today. I'm going to post this on the Facebook group later for those of you that don't get a chance to um, uh, see this. Uh, well, then why am I telling those that don't get a chance to see it? I don't know. Anyhow, uh, if you want to follow along with what I wrote here, I wrote some stuff on the Ica Stones today. If you're watching from the website and you don't want to interrupt the stream, you can right-click on the left-hand side on the button that says Q&A. If you right-click in there, you can select Open in a New Tab. Some say Clone Tab. Some say Duplicate Tab, something like that. Go ahead and click on that. It'll open up a new window. I'm doing this right now as we talk about it. And uh, it, at the, the very first question on the list should it say, Are the Ica Stones fake or real? Now, I had a long time ago a guy, I forget what his name is now. Oh, gosh, I've read his name like three different times today because I went and looked some stuff up. Maybe, you know, it's at the bottom. Let me see what that is. I'll look it up for you guys. That way you guys can look him up later if you'd like to. Uh, yeah, his name is K87Jury on YouTube. What happened was I was reading, uh, or I can't remember, I was talking to an evolutionist on email. I can't remember what it was exactly. But they referenced me to this k 8 K87 jury, okay? And they said, check out his video on the Ica Stones, and that'll show where you're wrong on the Ica Stones. Because I show Ica Stones, you know, in my seminar two and three on, on dinosaurs and the Bible and showing uh, ancient man being intelligent and things like that. And the thing is, I went to watch his video. It's about two and a half minutes long. He, he provides no references whatsoever and just basically says the whole thing's were, all of it was faked. So I happened to <laughs> just put a comment on there. I said, this was a waste of two and a half minutes of my time. I said, this, somebody sent me this thing. And I said, there was no information. There's nowhere I can even go to research anything else. I mean, you provided nothing with this. So this really is a, it's kind of a waste of time. 
boy, he got mad after that. He just, you know, he started posting all sorts of response videos to all my videos, just complaining. He has a very, uh, you know, I, I hate to say this about him, but, you know, he has a really hate-filled uh, YouTube channel. I mean, his entire channel, it's just filled with a bunch of videos that just hate, hate, hate Christianity. Hate Christians, Christianity in general. He hates God. If you're Christian, he hates you. And that's the way he handles it. Um, I'm sorry that, you know, how you if somebody hurt you along the way and that happened to you, I'm sorry about that. Uh, but I don't see a reason for, for all the hatred. But anyhow, he, um, he posts this on there. And so what I did is I posted this uh, article as kind of, a re kind of an answer to this that gives the real references. Um, I have some pictures on, on this article of the, uh, the different Ica stones you can see. I don't go into too great of detail. Um, if you want more detail, again, watch Seminar 2 or Seminar 3 uh, that are available for free on the website. There's some older versions of those seminars on there. I still need to get all my versions updated online. Uh, I haven't done that yet. But uh, this is, uh, I, I start to demonstrate that there's some people that write all sorts of things on, about these Ica stones that are just false. I mean, one of the guys' article that uh, seems to be a fairly popular one because it was, po it was published in a couple magazines was this guy named Philip Copens. And on his website, I referenced to it on here, the, the links at the, uh, right below the quote, if you want to see, he calls uh, Dr. Cabrera, who's the guy that owned, I mean, he, he's deceased now, but he had the largest collection in the world of these Ica stones, and he called Dr. Cabrera's father, called his name Bolivia, when Dr. Cabrera's father's name is Dom Pedro. So I don't, you know, and there's all sorts of mistakes and things like that in his, you know, I didn't bother to go through, because I could show you, you know, 20 different mistakes that he made in just basic information, uh, which shows the level of research that some of these people are doing with this. The thing is, what you have to understand before we go over these Ica stones is that if the Ica stones are real, it destroys the evolution theory completely. So the evolutionists need these to not be legitimate in any way, shape, or form they can get. Now, some people say, well, you know, there are some fakes and frauds made. And that's true. I don't claim that every Ica stone that's out there is real. Some of the people that are, some of the people are making these things up, okay? Uh, some people have admitted to, uh, you know, creating forgeries and all that. But just because people have made some fakes and frauds does not discount the evidence of the real thing. Just as, you know, you know, you have like Loch Ness Monster. I talk about this on, um, you know, Seminar 3, that, you know, the Loch Ness Monster, I mean, I would not trust the Weekly World News. I've got a picture of the Weekly World News showing, you know, Loch Ness Monster has a baby with these, fo with these doctored photographs. I wouldn't trust a source like that for your information on the Loch Ness Monster. And just because someone takes a picture of a stick coming out of the water and calls it the Loch Ness Monster, and then it's proven wrong, the evolutionists just jump on that and say, every single report is false. <laughs> that is so childish, it's unbelievable that they do that kind of thing. But they do it here with the Ica Stones as well. So um, here's uh, some of the problems. We have some scientific and archeological problems with those who want to say that the Ica Stones, are, that there's no legitimacy to any of the Ica Stones. Uh, this is a quote uh, that I, ha I have reference to on here that says, Father Sim uh, Simon, Father Simon, I guess is how you pronounce his name, a, Jesu a Jesuit missionary accompanied uh, Pizarro along the Peruvian coast and recorded his amazement upon viewing the stones. This was in 1535. In 1562, Spanish explorers sent some of the stones back to Spain. So the point of this is to show that in 1535, the Spanish conquistadors coming over uh, to South America found, we're, we're finding these strange stones with carvings of dinosaurs on them. They didn't, they didn't call them dinosaurs at the time, they just said they're strange creatures on these stones. So here, here's the thing, you know, because what they do is they claim, oh, people are just making these things and burying them in the ground or something like that, they're just making all these. Well, how, are, you, are we to believe that 500 years ago, someone living in South America was just carving these stones just to fool the evolutionists 500 years later? Who would have the time to sit around and just carve these stones for no reason whatsoever? And, but they have to believe in such things in order to discount the credibility of the Ica stones. They've been finding these things for hundreds of years. And I write here that in 1967, Dr. Cabrera picked 33 stones out of his collection and sent them to, it says, Morocco Hoschild, 
Mining Company in Lima, Peru, to be examined for age and test if they, if they had been recently deposited by a grave robber who was carving them just to make extra money. So he was testing these to find out if we could find age. Eric Wolf, a geologist who worked at the MHMC laboratory, sent back his signed analysis, and here's what he said. He said the stones are covered with a fine patina of natural oxidation, which also covers the grooves by which age should be able to be deduced. So he's saying there should be a way to tell how the old these things are, but they couldn't do it at the laboratory there. They weren't qualified, so he sent it somewhere else. Uh, and I, I quote some th some other people who are saying that the that there were it was an oxidation patina on these on these things. Uh, but this is uh, from F. G. Hawley, who's an experienced chemist and archaeologist. He said many artifacts in dry Western country show little or no patina after seven or eight hundred years. So just what by what he's saying here, the very fact that it has an oxida oxidation uh, patina to it is showing us that these have to be you know, at least seven to eight hundred years old. So people, I mean, the, the stones that he has, that Dr. Cabrera had in his collection, which I think belong to Dr. Dennis Swift now, if I remember correctly, I think they've been uh, sold uh, to some places. Like, for example, I've been, to, uh, I've been personally to Pensacola, Florida, to see the largest collection in the United States. And I find it funny that so many of the evolutionists that scoff at the Ica stones and scoff at the Bible at the same time uh, they've never actually seen them themselves. They've never even gone to even even check it out. Um, but under microscopic analysis, we can tell that because of the oxidation coating patina that it has on the grooves, they have to be hundreds of years old. So the people, I mean, if they want to claim that people have carved these, you have to get around the scientific and archaeological evidence on this. Uh, and, you know, one of the, the guy in the video that, uh, what, K... 8-7 jury, yeah, that guy. He, uh, the video, I think, is called uh, Debunking Creationist Ica Stones. You can go check that out for yourself and see him uh, scoff at this. Uh, he's only got, I mean, what happened is as soon as I, I posted that comment, he, post, he did post one reference to all the information he had. He posted one reference to a skeptic website. Uh, but then when I clicked on the link he posted for it, it was broken. So, <laughs> I mean, he got all angry that I posted. He didn't post any references, and then when he tried to post references, he didn't even do it right, I guess. I don't know. I don't know what happened there. It may have moved or something. I have no idea. Uh, but it's just it's so ridiculous, I think, for him to get so angry over that. Uh, but he showed, he said, and I quote him, he said that the stones showed evidence of having sandpaper used on them, but here I have uh, Ryan Drum, who's an American biologist, who examined these. He says, I have examined the rocks at 30 and 60 magnification in a stereo microscope and found no obvious grinding or polish marks. Well, I think at that magnification, he could tell if somebody was rubbing this thing with sandpaper. Uh, but he said there were no grinding or polish marks. So, I mean, there seems to be some problems with, uh, you know, with the evolutionist claims versus the scientific data we're actually getting on these Ica stones. And so some people are saying, well, why don't we get some of these Ica stones, you know, brought over to the Amer America and really analyzed? Because who's going to pay for that? Who is going to pay for their precious evolution theory to be proven wrong? Nobody's going to do that. There's a huge, I mean, uh, folks, I keep saying this over and over. Evolution is a multi-billion dollar industry. Uh, and you have to treat it, so, when you ask these questions, you have to treat it like it's a multi-billion dollar industry because there's grant money, there's book deals, there's you know traveling speaking engagements, there's tons of money wrapped up into the evolution theory. So, and of course, you know, the teachers and their, you know, the positions of these doctors and people who are making, you know, you know, five and six figure incomes, they definitely do not want to, you know, relinquish those for some evidence that proves that the Bible has been correct all along. That is something they definitely do not want. Um, and so another common evidence that's used against the Ica stones, I'll mention this uh, last piece of this, and then uh, we'll go on to some more questions if we have them. But another evidence that's used against the Ica stones is they talk about a farmer called uh, Ikuya, Ikuya or Echuya. I don't know how, you, how do you pronounce that. It's E-C-H-U-Y-A. Um, but let me, let me give this first. If they're going to say, okay, this farmer, this peasant, carved all the stones that are used. Okay, he carved out all these stones in Dr. Cabrera's collection. Well, it's funny because the evolutionists that make this claim, number one, don't even know how many stones Dr. Cabrera has. They, they keep thinking, oh, he's probably got a few hundred of these stones. 
Folks, he has 11,000 in his collection alone. There are more collections beyond his. But to say that these people carved all these, you know, and there were two people that were accused of doing it. I wrote here, if it's true that he's making some stones and selling them, does that account for the stones found 500 years ago? Was he making stones for the past 500 years? And does his fake stones account for all the Ica stones discovered over the past few decades? See, using the submission of forgery does not disprove the Ica stones altogether, okay? And you're not, you're, I mean, just saying that some of these might be a forgery does not disprove or does not give an accounting for the evidence of the real thing, and that's what you need to focus on. Uh, I would say, you know, again, I, I, I consider that where they just jump on the forgery and they stick to that. I call that childishness. I call that immaturity. I do not call that real research. And I think a real researcher, I mean, if those of you are claiming you do research and you just jump on the forgeries, you're not being a skeptic. You're being childish. And you need to uh, learn to look at everything. So uh, this guy said, um, this was a, a um, interview with a lady named Irma. It's Irma and Basilio. That's the two names of the two people that were uh, supposedly admitted to making these forgeries. Uh, Irma said the workable stone came from an embankment some 50 meters high, situated about two kilometers from her house. Now stop and consider this. 11,000 stones. Don't you think there would be a crater somewhere where they had dug all these out? I mean, they took them over to this area. I mean, nothing was dug out, and they started digging, and she dug, you know, a hole for a few feet and found one tiny stone about the size of a mandarin orange and said, oh, oh, here's one. Uh, that we used to carve these things with. Well, they're not even including that one of, the, I mean, the, the biggest stones that Dr. Cabrera had in his collection, one of them weighed a uh, thousand pounds, a half a ton. So that doesn't count for all the different sizings they use, and the only, only stones they find in this area where she showed they dug were about the size of mandarin oranges. It doesn't show where she dug up all the rest of them. Plus, where's the gigantic crater why did the other townsfolk not notice these people carrying these gigantic stones back and forth and doing all this stuff? It's like nobody noticed. I mean, this is, there are people that live near this area. Um, so there's all sorts of problems with that. In addition, Dr. Cabrera alone, and I wrote he had over 11,000 stones, uh, and I, without anybody noticing, Hamilton Foreman, who's an archaeologist researching Ica stones, he said if one family did this, they must have had an army of elves helping them. <laughs> and that's about the, the logic of it. I mean, it doesn't seem uh, at all correct that anybody could possibly accomplish this on their own. I mean, even if you had a team of people, I doubt you could still accomplish this. This would take an extraordinary amount of excavating equipment, which these peasants obviously don't have. And also, a Peruvian jail sentence is about the equivalent of American death sentence. I mean, you don't, if you get put in a Peruvian jail, they don't feed you, they don't clothe you, they don't take care of you like they do here in America, okay? They put you into a locked cell and they leave you to die. That's how they handle people. If your family does not bring you food and clothing, you're going to die in that prison. So while they were questioning, I mean, the police brought him into, brought both of them into an interrogation room and said, are you, are you digging up these Peruvian treasures? Because it's illegal, according to government law over there, to sell, dig up Peruvian treasures, like artifacts, and sell them. You're not allowed to do that, at least without, you know, government author, author, uh, authorization, because the government wants their money out of it. But the, the thing is, they admitted in, to the police that they made these. I was like, oh, we just, we carved these things. You know, and they asked me, oh, well, go prove that you carved them. And, you know, they tried to make one, and they just made some really crappy versions <laughs> that weren't very good at all. And, but even, uh, remember, we talked about Philip Coppins at the beginning, because he's not, he's a guy that's not, uh, I mean, he's, he's against the Ica Stones being authentic. But even in his article, he wrote the following. This is the one that was published in a couple of magazines. He wrote, when uh, Von uh, Daiken, or Daniken, which, how you pronounce this, Daniken, something like that, um, visited the farmer in 1973. This uh, Bas uh, Basilia, or Basilia uh, confirmed to him that he had faked the stones, but later on in an interview with the German journalist Andreas Fischer, uh, Basilia claimed the opposite. They were genuine, he insisted, and he admitted to a hoax to avoid imprisonment. So even the people that are against the Ica stones are saying, look, he did admit later that he did make that up just so he wouldn't get thrown in jail, 
and that he was actually digging these up and finding them and selling them so that they are legitimate. So, look, folks, I tell the skeptics all the time, if you would just do a little research, you wouldn't have to be so skeptical, okay? Um, and, and nobody's going to pay for this research because they don't want to prove the evolution theory wrong, because they like the evolution theory, because it gives them freedom from God. That's the whole reason that they hang on to the evolution theory. So if you, um, if you look at the bottom of that article that I was talking about, there are some just suggested reading materials. There's a couple of good books, as well as our uh, Garden of Eden seminar number two on DVD, which you can order from us by going to uh, our online store, or you can email us at sales at creationliberty.com. Uh, and we can order some of those books for you, like The Secrets of the Ica Stones and Nazca Lines by Dennis Swift. is a fantastic book. We can order that for you if you would like to get through our ministry. Again, write us at sales at creationliberty.com, and we can uh, give you a, a reasonable price for that. So I need to go back, and where was I? I need to go back to the chat. Uh, let's see here. FYI, no questions right now. Okay, well, we have an awful lot of guests, as for, from what I'm hearing. We have a bunch of guests. Uh, I, hey, I highly encourage you to come in and join the chat. You know, even if you're an evolutionist or an atheist and you're just watching to check this thing out, come join us in chat. I'm more than happy to take uh, any kind of questions. You guys are welcome to come on in, and we have some friendly folks in here. We're, we're not against, you know, uh, talking with atheists and evolutionists. Just because we don't agree with your position doesn't mean we don't want to talk with you. I certainly do. Uh, I want to see some people get converted anyway, uh, though I don't think uh, that's going to happen on this show. I'm not, I, I don't know. But, uh, you know, I definitely want to talk with you all. And we are still working on, uh, like I said, I am very busy right now. I'm working on a bunch of projects, and one of them is to try to get some Skype calls so we can have some, interview some live evolutionists uh, and live atheists on some different issues. But I want to finish some uh, projects I have for some other shows before I start that up. Uh, so what we're going to go ahead and do is get to, I'm going to take a drink real quick. That's better. Okay. Now we're going to get back to some stuff that we left off with last week uh, concerning some of the um, evidences of a young Earth. And we were talking about, last time we, we left off talking about comets, how comets flying th around through our solar system, that you're going to, uh, they have a limitation to the age of them. So most of these comets, like the short period comets, uh, things like Halley's Comet that fly around, they only have a life expectancy of about 10,000 years or less which causes somewhat of a problem because that, that leaves us with the question, why haven't we lost these comets by now? Now, the evolutionists have come up with an explanation for this, which I, I find kind of hilarious, called the Oort Cloud. Okay? The Oort Cloud, I'm going to read you uh, something from a, this is an article posted by a guy named Dave Matson, uh, called A Close Look at Young Earth Arguments and Other Claims. And this is what he wrote in there. He said, in, in 1950, based on a study of the orbits of several long-period comets, the Dutch astronomer Jan Oort proposed, proposed means he wished and hoped and prayed that there was a spherical shell of comets. He says, that a, a great spherical shell of, of comets existed at the remote frontiers of our solar system. Now, he proposed this based on what, what they call the Hubble constant. And you have to be careful... Uh, I think I write more about this on, there's an article, if you click on, uh, you know, like I said, you right-click, open a new window on articles, and there's an article called the Big Dud Theory. I, I cover more on what they call the Hubble constant, I have to put in quotations, because the Hubble constant is not a constant at all. Uh, because it's all, well, first of all, it's always moving. So you, you don't really know what your constants are supposed to be. Um, but there's all sorts of mathematical errors that can be obtained from Hubble constants, and I'll just read you a couple qu quotes real quick. Uh, this one is from Carl Sagan, uh, and he's a, he's a <laughs> profound defender of evolution. He claims to be a Christian, uh, but I, I don't know if I believe that or not. Uh, but he, he believes strictly in evolution. Uh, I, and the thing is, here's what he said. Even This was even concerning the, uh, the Oort cloud. He says, many scientific papers are written each year about the Oort cloud, its properties, its origin, its evolution. Yet there is not a shred of direct observational evidence for its existence. And he believes in evolution. He says, look, this just it doesn't make any sense. It's not mathematically possible. Uh, this is uh, Raymond Littleton in an article, he, a science article he wrote for, um, this is in the Journal of Astrophysics and Space Science, Volume 31, 1974. He wrote, Oort proposed a cloud of comets surrounding the solar system based on mathematical errors. So there's a lot of credible people that would go on record and say, look, this Oort cloud, it doesn't exist, and you guys need to prove that it exists. But I want to go back to this Dave Madsen article. Uh, I'm, 
I can read this off to you. I guess if you guys want to see if you can find it, I'll read it off to you slowly. The website, a specific link is www.evolution-creationism.us slash young underscore earth slash comets dot html. I'm sure nobody can type that fast. But I just want to tell you where I'm getting this from in case you go back and watch, watch this again. You can see it for yourself. Uh, and I'm going to go look at his article right now. This is very interesting. Um, <laughs> it's hilarious. This, this is about uh, the fourth paragraph down, if you take a look at it. He says, The creationism's main argument seems to be that we don't have close-up photos of the Oort cloud. Stop right there. That's not the main argument. The main argument we're saying, it doesn't exist. It's based on mathematical errors. And yes, we don't need close-up photographs. Any photographs, any kind of indication that this thing exists at all, we do not have. So if, I mean, if you're going to claim something we have absolutely no evidence of exists, then you better have some evidence. To, I mean, you need to have something extremely strong and large, logical to back that up. But watch what he does here. Um, he says that the uh, creationist argument seems to be that we don't have close-up photos of the Oort cloud and therefore cannot be 100% certain that it really exists. I agree. And here's what he said to this. Sorry, fellows, but if you want to use this comet argument, it is up to you to prove beyond a reasonable doubt that the Oort cloud and other sources don't exist. Are you kidding me? How do you go about proving the non-existence of something? Don't you have to be all places at all times at the same time to prove the non-existence of something? You don't just tell people, you prove it doesn't exist. I mean, come on, you're trying to shift, it's what you call shifting the burden of proof, okay? And you can't do that. We have no evidence that such an Oort cloud exists, and that, but that, they, you see, the, the evolutionists, they have to hang on to the Oort cloud, even though they know they don't have any evidence for it, because they have nothing to replace. They have no theory to replace the Oort cloud. So, I mean, and this is common for the evolutionists to make up things that produce things uh, all the time. And we're going to cover more on that as we go through some of the evidences of a, uh, some of the evidence of a young earth here. That we're going to talk about some of that stuff. Let me, let me double check here and make sure we got no questions or anything because that might have popped up a few things. Uh, no, it looks like we, uh, so, so far, so good. Uh, so far, so good. Yeah, that's, that's the phrase. That's how you use that. So we'll keep going here. Uh, we'll probably just go for a few more minutes, and then I'm going to uh, go ahead and uh, stop for this uh, episode. But one of the interesting things is that magnets lose their strength over time. You know, you stick a magnet on your refrigerator. I don't know if anybody, any, any of you um, who are watching this have done that. If you stick a magnet on the refrigerator, as it stays there for so long, I know months or years, depending on the magnet, it slowly starts to slide down the refrigerator because it slowly starts to lose its magnetic properties. So magnets lose their strength over time. Now what you also have to understand is the Earth is a gigantic magnet. I mean, that's basically what it is. It has a huge magnetic field. But the Earth's magnetic field is getting weaker slowly over time. And this is causing a problem. Uh, well, I mean, it's not causing a, a too much of a physical problem right now, but eventually it will. Because the Earth's magnetic field has decreased by at least 6% just in the last 150 years. Well, if the magnetic field is decreasing, I guess the obvious question is, why haven't we completely lost our magnetic field by now? Why is it still decreasing if the Earth is supposed to be billions of years old? Well, my theory is that the Earth is not millions and billions of years old. The Earth is young. You see, if you only start with a 6,000 years ago for the creation of the world, the magnet, the magnetism, the loss in the magnetism is absolutely no problem for the creationist. But it's a serious problem for the evolutionist. Now, the thing is, we also have to consider that if, if the magnetic field of the Earth is getting weaker, that means if you go back in the past, it used to be stronger, right? And this creates another problem. Uh, I have a couple of uh, articles I reference to here. Uh, you can look up, uh, let's see here, uh, you can see McDonald, what's KL and RH uh, Gunst, Earth's Magnetic Field from 1835 to 60, uh, 1965. They published that in 1967. Um, and some of that, uh, some others from Thomas G. Barnes, uh, Depletion of the Earth's Magnetic Field from the Institute for Creation Research. You can check out some of that stuff. They have some good articles on those. But the thing is, from these articles, you'll find that this is limiting the age of the Earth. Because if you get, I mean, because the magnetic field has a half-life 
from studies that have been done that shows the half-life of the magnetic field of the Earth is about 1,400 years. So that means, you know, if you start off with, you know, such and such, you know, magnetic field, in 1,400 years, half of that will be gone. In 1,400 years, half of that will be gone. And it keeps cutting in half like that. Well, if you go back in time from the current Earth's magnetic field and calculate that way, that limits the age of the Earth to a minimum of 15,000 years because the magnetic field at that point would be too strong for life to exist. There would be all sorts of problems, not to mention that a magnetic field is generally, I mean, you're going to have some problems with the Earth's, uh, the, the heat of Earth's core. I mean, there's, there's quite a few problems you're going to run into, but basically the major problem of this would be life cannot exist with a magnetic field that strong. Well, how do they answer this? Well, let me give you their answer, and this is kind of a, this is also another ridiculous answer. They have a machine that they drag across the ocean floor, and they're detecting the magnetism of the ocean floor. So they'll get some areas that are stronger magnetism, and so they get a wavy line on a graph, and it'll go up, stronger magnetism, and then they'll find an area, oh, this is weaker magnetism, so they'll get a wavy line that goes down. And another one's a little stronger, and another one's a little weaker, and it goes stronger, weaker, stronger, weaker, stronger, weaker in this line, in this uh, wavy line. So that's all they're finding is areas of stronger and weaker magnetism. That's it. So what the what an evolutionist decided to do is he came through and he drew a line through the middle of this wavy line. He drew a line through the middle, and he said everything below the line is reversing. Now why did he say this? Because he needs it to be reversing. He needs the magnetic field to be reversing so that way they can claim, well, the magnetic field is coming back. It gets weaker, yeah, but it comes back later and then it gets weaker again. It just fluctuates back and forth. Well, I will contend there is no place on the ocean floor that you get reverse polarity because then you would have places on the ocean floor where a north-seeking compass is going to point south. That's just not going to happen. Okay? There are no areas of, of reversal, okay? That's if I got a, let's say I had a picture lined up right here. I had people of different height. I had someone taller than me, someone shorter than me. And what we did is we came up and drew a line through the middle of us and said everyone below the line is underground. That makes no sense whatsoever, okay? And that's, you know, look, if you want to believe the, the magnet field of the ocean is reversing, to protect your evolution theory, you are welcome to that belief. That's perfectly fine. But that is not part of science. That's part of your belief, okay? And trying to, you know, tell, if you tell, go out and tell people, I have evidence of this. We have the scientific evidence that proves this. Okay, that's where you're lying about your theory. You see, it's okay to have a it's okay to have a dumb theory. I could have a dumb theory and say the moon is made of blue cheese. That's a dumb theory, but I'm a, there's no laws against having dumb theories. However, it's wrong if I go out and say, yeah, but scientists went to the moon, you know, in the 1960s and found out that you know there is the blue cheese on the moon. Okay, now I'm lying to give evidence for my theory. And what I'm telling the evolutionists is that you're going out and telling people, you know, we have evidence, you know. The Earth's millions of years old because, you know, of reverse polarity and things like that. That's one of the evidences they use in the textbooks to try to convince the children that the Earth is millions of years old. You're lying, okay? It's, it's flat out and simple. It's a lie. It's absolutely not true. And if you want to believe it is, that's perfectly fine. You can go and believe that. But that ought not to be taught at taxpayer expense in the public school system. And it's not part of science. So it's, I'm sorry, that's your religious belief. So I think, uh, let's see, I'm going to check to see if we have any other questions or comments, any last-minute things. Let me check on the chat room here. I don't think we've got anything else. Well, I think that's it. I think we, we have an awful lot of guests, uh, not many people that signed in. Uh, I hope you guys will be uh, willing to sign in with us next time and join us on here. And uh, that's, that, that's perfectly fine. If you just want to watch, that's no problem. You can check the chat if you want to. But, you know, again, the chat's purpose is there for discussion. It's there for questions. So... Uh, if you didn't feel like you wanted to participate that time, this time, that's okay. You know, join us next time, okay? But I think that's all we're going to have for today. I'm going to go ahead and, sh and, and cut this off for now. Uh, next week, we'll cover some more stuff on the age of the earth. I am trying to work right now to get my friend uh, Sean Rose over here. He, um, when he got his degree, he studied a whole lot of philosophy, and we, we're going to discuss the atheist and Christian debate. If I can ever get him out here one day, trying to, you know, get him when he's got spare time, it's like pulling teeth. But if I can get him out here, we're going to have uh, probably multiple episodes on the uh, Christian atheist debate, and we're going to try to invite some atheists onto a Skype program to interview them live, if they'd be willing to do that, and present uh, their side of the argument. 
um, and that'll be a lot of fun. So I wanted to thank uh, Andy for helping us out today. We, I really needed somebody else to help me out with the chat room, and uh, he volunteered for that today, and I appreciate it. And if you guys wanted to uh, want to uh, continue in the discussion, for those of you who uh, like discussion on certain topics and want to see our updates, you need to join us on our Facebook group. If you click on Join Us on Facebook at the top of the page, that you're viewing the stream from if you're on the website uh, that'll link you to our Facebook group where we have a lot of discussions and I encourage you to join that and we have a lot of fun there so for now uh, that's that'll be it for today for our show and join us on show number seven next week I think uh, okay today's the 12th so next week next week will be 19th Monday the 19th at uh, 7 p.m. and we will see you guys next week so thanks for tuning in see you later <laughs>